Hello and welcome to Iron Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zubko. The US formally suspended the international agreement called the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty on the 1st February 2019, and Russia did so on the following day in response. The United States withdrew from the treaty on the 2nd August 2019. The second example, on 21st of February 2023, during the presidential address to the Federal Assembly, Vladimir Putin announced the suspension of Russia's participation in the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, and on the 2nd of June, the United States revoked visas of Russian nuclear inspectors. Based on these two facts, I would like to elaborate on the topic of strategic arms control, and I'm wondering, do we still have any sort of arms control globally if those big powers are suspending the agreements? And sometimes it also seems that when Russia or United States, they ignore the strategic agreement, will other powers stick to arms control or will they do the same? And to explain this problematic today, I invited my guest, Dr. Andrew Reddy. Hello, Andrew. Hi there. Dr. Andrew Reddy is an associate research professor at the University of California, uh, Berkeley's Goldman School of Public Policy, and the founder of the Berkeley Risk and Security Lab. His research at the intersection of technology, politics, and security examines how technology shapes international order with a focus on nuclear weapons policy, cybersecurity, and AI governments. So, Andrew, let's start with the first uh, fundamental question, and that's uh, how has the concept of arms control shift from the Cold War era to the present? Uh, what sort of dynamics can we see? And uh, what's the impact of technological advancements on this development? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first thing I'll say is that when scholars like me speak about arms control, there's definitely some contested definitions inside of this space. Um, so it has been the case, even during the Cold War, that we had technology governance regimes entirely outside of what we would call nuclear arms control or formal arms control agreements that generally is what you know folks are thinking about when you say things like INF, Treaty, New START, uh, etc. Um, obviously, in the years following the Cold War, um, you had effectively the continuation of a lot of the agreements that were negotiated kind of during that paradigm. Um, and we also had various different uh, arrangements to disarm and denuclearize countries that had nuclear weapons following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And those kind of continued. And so ultimately, New START, which is a strategic arms reduction treaty um, that kind of sets a cap on the number and describes which types of weapons various different signatories are going to have, namely Russia and the United States. Um, you know, that that was kind of what we thought of when we said um, arms control. Obviously, as you mentioned in the introduction, that kind of formal nuclear arms control layer um, has kind of disappeared over the last five or six years, um, which is not to say that all of a sudden we have a significant increase in the number of nuclear arms uh, as the countries have effectively created this sort of normative cap, uh, at least for now. Now, whether that holds into the future or not, I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, but you know, we'll, we'll kind of see there. In terms of broader technology governance conversations, those have never gone away. Um, and so you do have conversations amongst countries that can't agree on very much, but can agree that it's useful to engage in places like Geneva to discuss lethal autonomous weapons or want to engage on the military applications of AI or on broader AI safety discussions. And so I think that one of the things that, you know, we need to be careful about is that scoping, right? What is arms control? What is technology governance? Um, is it only formal nuclear related treaties or, you know, is there something else as well? Um, for what it's worth, I'm quite optimistic about the potential of technology governance moving forward, even if we're not likely to see formal, verifiable nuclear related treaties um, anytime soon. In terms of how technologies in general are changing arms control, certainly they change how you would want to think about verification regimes. Um, so a lot of work has been done among scientists and engineers to kind of ver create tools that can help us verify that countries are, are actually abiding by their agreements. Um, so that's something that's changing. But of course, technologies are also changing what's actually relevant to think about governing in the future. Um, and so you've got, again, two different kind of roads to go down when you're thinking about the impact of emerging tech in this space. 
when we speak about arms control, and and this is this is a good point that you mentioned that we have more categories of of uh, weapons. So mostly, yeah. is it about nuclear weapons, or or what is the second or third place when we speak about arms control? Because some people might also consider chemical weapons, maybe biological uh, weapons. So is this whole package of the control? Absolutely. And so the Chemical Weapons Convention is a really good example, Biological Weapons Convention. And um, there's also historical examples of limits on conventional capabilities. Uh, so, for example, the Washington Naval Treaty that was dealing with capital ships um, and the more recently, the Conventional Forces in Europe or CFE Treaty um, did the same. Um, and if, so effectively, you can think about any number of arrangements that are going to limit um, either the proliferation of capability, the deployment of capability, or the use of capability. Um, and there's different reasons for doing so um, across this space. And so, yeah, I mean, I do I do in my work, I take a very broad view of what constitutes arms control or technology governance, uh, because we do actually have a lot of different examples to touch on. Um, the other category that's worth noting here as well is that there are domain-related agreements. So, for example, the Seabed Treaty or the Outer Space Treaty that deal with the impact of weapons, whether they be nuclear or conventional, across a domain. Um, and so that's important to note as well. Um, so again, you know, it's it's sometimes worth taking a little bit of an expansive definition here um, as well. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I mean, even, even arguably, you can go back in history and look at the various different arrangements that existed during the Roman times and say, well, there was a disarmament treaty because ultimately, you know, Carthage was forced to give up all of its weapons. Um, and so, you know, again, that definitional piece is something that scholars spend a lot of time kind of debating and talking about. Right. Maybe remember those uh, historical photographs of Gorbachev and Reagan when they were signing mm -hmm. INF uh, in the past. And, and then yeah. we, had, we had a sort of period of time that arms control was quite successful. What were the factors that contributed to that success? And can we compare those factors with today's challenges? Here, here I might say something slightly controversial. Um, so in, in, in my view, arms control arrangements and technology governance arrangements reflect a strategic calculus amongst those that sign the agreement, that the agreement is worthwhile for them. So ultimately, in my view, um, when, when I'm doing my work, arms control agreements are coming from a strategic basis, not a normative basis. And so basically, so what, what arms control agreements are doing is effectively saying, okay, it's in, let's say the United States interest to sign this arrangement. It's in Russia's interest to sign this arrangement. And by the way, it's stability enhancing at the system level. Therefore, we're going to do it. And so that's really important. So there's effectively two different levels of analysis that are being uh, addressed by arms control arrangements. So it might be a country saying, I want to move this competition with my adversary into a different domain, right? Such that I can limit my spending on the incremental addition of a nuclear warhead to my arsenal. Um, and so I want to sign this agreement in of myself. And then my adversary agrees with that perspective. And then also, by the way, right, we're limiting the number of nuclear weapons overall that drive all of this risk of accidents, miscalculation, et cetera. Um, and so that's really kind of where you see these agreements um, arising. And ultimately, the success, right, for a period of time of things like, right, start, start, well, start one, um, and then um, eventually new start, INF, is that that strategic calculus held. Um, and it held until obviously the Russians made the decision that they wanted to chase after intermediate range nuclear forces. Um, and, you know, ultimately the Americans sat on the non-compliance for a few years before ultimately leaving that arrangement. Um, and there's obviously stories that you can tell yourself as to why the Russians would think that a ban for them on intermediate range nuclear forces was you know, no longer strategically beneficial. Um, and so, you know, we can talk about that later if you'd like. But um but effectively, what you have is that period of success driven by a recognition upon both sides that these are strategically useful arrangements. And then we built a whole layer of effectively um, technology verification regimes, et cetera, to build trust amongst the parties that you know ultimately um, they were you know willing to abide by the agreement, were abiding by the agreement, and we were kind of building that trust. And you know, there were some pretty... Um, 
extensive monitoring programs that actually involve, for example, U.S. troops in Russia and for a period of time, Russian troops in the United States. And that's very difficult to imagine today. But that portal monitoring system, again, was all, you know, a part of an institutional infrastructure that was built on top of these arrangements that kind of built up that trust. Um, and so, you know, even today, there are still conversations that are kind of pushing on creating various different lab to lab or private sector to private sector collaborations to try to re-engage that trust. But ultimately, we built that over time. And then, of course, like I mentioned at the beginning and you mentioned in the introduction, five, the last five or six years have not been a positive story for um, for that particular uh, regime. I just want to add that when we say start, that doesn't mean start and go, but it's the no, strategic yeah, yeah, arms reduction agree. treaty. We still have some states that are, are trying to get some weapons and, and they may, might have some influence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be good, I think, to explain how the non-state actors and states which are not superpowers influence the process of arms control. Yeah, so, I mean, there are any number of efforts trying to arrest the capability of non-state actors to acquire weapons of mass destruction, but also conventional capabilities. And so again, in my view, things like export control regimes, so for example, the missile technology control regime, or the nuclear suppliers group, um, or the Australia group, all of those are effectively arms control or technology governance regimes insofar as they're managing the spread of a technology that has some sort of military applications. Uh, the Wassenaar Agreement is another good example. Um, and so the challenge for countries who are producing technology is that a lot of technology can be dual use. So dual use insofar as it can be used for civilian applications and military applications. And what you want to try to avoid are non-state actors, terrorist actors, etc., getting their hands on a particular type of technology or widget and then using it for uh, military purposes, terrorist purposes, etc. And so we've built a, a pretty significant number of regimes to deal with that problem in the UN context, in many lateral contexts, so many lateral, right, smaller groups of countries that kind of have something of a monopoly over a particular technology. The nuclear suppliers gives a really good example um, to try to make sure that, you know, you don't have non-state actors getting their hands on this type of material. In, in terms of technology governance that doesn't involve the United States and Russia in and of themselves in some sort of bilateral arrangement, again, we have all sorts of examples. Um, the Conference on Disarmament inside the UN, for example, um, but also, too, bilaterally between other nuclear right armed countries. So Pakistan and India, for example, have multiple agreements that are um, trying to drive the risk of nuclear use down. Um, one of the things that has been discussed, particularly here in the United States over the last four or five years, is how you want to try to deal with a you know, a, a, a Chinese government that is quantitatively increasing and qualitatively broadening its nuclear forces. And so, you know, there's the famous picture in Vienna where the Chinese refused to show up for the talks that the Trump administration had asked them uh, to attend, and that would have been a trilateral. Um, and there's also conversations about whether any future arrangements involving the U.S. and Russia might need to also include the French and the British. Um, up to now, right, that wasn't that wasn't deemed necessary. Um, and then, of course, you've got North Korea lurking in the background who has no agreements with anybody, uh, but, you know, the ostensibly, you know, may or may not take instructions from Beijing. So, um, you know, it's definitely becoming an increasingly complicated picture. Um, you know, I think you, you, the three body problem has been used to describe this issue. Um, in reality, it's probably three plus body problem um, in the nuclear domain. Uh, but again, you've got any number of examples. And again, the challenge is making sure that, that states are abiding by their by their um, you know commitments to any particular treaty um, and that others can trust that they are doing so. And so that's really the core challenge of any sort of technology governance regime. Andrew, when we have, uh, for instance, finance, there is an international monetary fund or World Bank. So yep. these institutions are keeping an eye on those old regimes and multilateral initiatives. Is there anything like that uh, in arms control? So you mentioned those regimes and treaties mm -hmm. and everything. Do we have any body which is above and is sort of supervising what's going on? I would probably call it more like institutional layering as you look okay. across different technologies. Um, obviously, the the example that I think will come to mind for most most people is the I, the IAEA, so the International Atomic Energy Agency. 
um, and they're responsible for non-proliferation, so making sure that the non-nuclear weapon states right, don't acquire nuclear material. Um, and they're primarily worried about the, the, um, the divergence of material used in the civilian nuclear energy sector and then moving that over into the military sector. Um, and so that's why they built you know, a, a pretty significant safeguards regime. It's called nuclear safeguards. Safeguards regime to stop that from happening. Um, and so one of the, the the great challenges for the IAEA is to make sure that all of humanity, right, derives the benefit of nuclear technology, primarily via energy, um, although some of the nuclear propulsion use cases in space also fall in that category, um, but that you don't have the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And so basically the IAEA is connected to the N Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is pretty special, um, right? So in 1995, when that treaty um, was revised to last in perpetuity, it was one of the very first arrangements that basically had countries agreeing that there were differences among them that was intrinsic um, and that some countries could have nuclear weapons and other countries could not. Um, I would submit that in 2024, that type of treaty would be very, very difficult to negotiate and ratify. Um, so um, that's what the IAEA is set up to do. And so that gets the that gets the lion's share of the attention. Uh, but like I said, all of the export control regimes that exist multilaterally are definitely in bounds. The various different UN committees um, are also in bounds. Um, and again, it's kind of, they all layer upon one another. Um, but at some point, no, no particular, no regime is going to arrest a country that really wants to do right, uh, proliferation in a particular space. I think we learned that lesson with North Korea, um, where, you know, ultimately they did nuclearize despite, um, the existence of these regimes. Um, Yeah. Many people will also ask an interesting question about the veri verification mechanisms. How is that verification mechanism process? So we know that the numbers officially declared and the numbers in storages or in reality, they match. Yep. So, so yeah, so that first piece that, that you just mentioned there is really important. So ultimately, the process begins with the data exchange. So countries, well... Under New Start, right, Russia and the United States reporting to one another, this is how many nuclear warheads we have across the various different types of uh, nuclear delivery platforms that each country is is running. Um, there, there were in both countries a, a a significant number of nuclear warheads that fell outside of the treaty obligations because they were deemed to be non strategic nuclear warheads, right, or non strategic nuclear weapons. So these were, those were never governed by any sort of regime. And that was one of the major points of contention between the two negotiating teams, both for New Start and then whatever we may or may not end up with down the road. Um, so inside of the treaty framework, it starts with the data exchange. And then you had on-site inspections that are effectively there to verify that data exchange. In extremists, you had portal monitoring. So for the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, because basically what you were worried about were missiles that fell within a particular range, we effectively used circumference of the of the rocket as a proxy for how far it could fly. And then you were running right those through X-ray machines operated by each country. Um, but that was a fairly intrusive monitoring regime, I would, I would argue. Um, and so that's really what we rely on. Um, so you have this continuum. There, there are also um, any number of technology governance arrangements that don't have any sort of verification regime whatsoever. So it's purely a promise. Um, and also there's another category where um, you've got regimes that are governed by um, what's euphemistically termed national technical means. So that's effectively the use of intelligence assets to make sure that you know, the two parties to an arrangement are actually abiding by the caps that are set on the number of warheads, number of delivery platforms of a particular type or what have you. Um, and some of those treaties actually had language that said that it would be non-interference with those types of national technical means, whether they be satellites or, um, you know, YouTube flyover, et cetera. Um, so, so yeah, you've got a couple of different tools at your disposal. Andrew, do we know about any loopholes uh, by the time? about those uh, mechanisms. 
So in order, I mean, different countries do this differently, right? So for the United States, right, to make a determination of compliance or non-compliance on an arms control agreement that has a formal treaty framework, um, you know, effectively you have both sides for any particular on-site inspection regime because it involves putting foreign nationals on effectively a military base of which you have the most sensitive types, right? They are nuclear assets after all. Um, there's all sorts of negotiation about this is where we're going to go, right? These are the conditions under which I'm going to be able to say that you're complying or not complying. And all, a lot of that's actually spelled out in the appendices of the of the treaties themselves. Um, so the, the lawyers love this, right? Because it keeps them in a job, right? All of that legal esoterica. Um, in terms of there being disagreements over the interpretation of the language inside of a treaty, absolutely. Um, so both the United States and Russia accuse one another of violating the ABM treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Um, so, um, and that is primarily dealing with missile defense uh, capabilities. Um, and so, you know, there you have um, all sorts of um, all sorts of challenges going going in both directions. Outside of the U.S. Russia context, you also have potential loopholes in the language inside of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and how it's been. Uh, implemented by the IAEA's Board of Governors. Um, so we have some work, for example, on non-prescribed military use of nuclear uh, technologies, um, namely naval propulsion. Um, so you could use nuclear uh, technology um, in place of a diesel engine, for example, on a surface vessel or on a submarine. And so as countries around the world look at using um, naval propulsion, systems, um, whether that be Australia, Canada, South Korea, Brazil, Argentina, who have all variously had that that type of plan at one point or another. Um, there's also that problem inside of um, the um, the IAEA that needs to get addressed because the same applies, right? Like they don't want to have IAEA inspectors walking through their military installations and potentially right sharing that material and information. Um, because while the IAEA inspectors, right, while they're working for a UN organization, do not represent their country of origin, obviously the fear is that they're reporting everything back to their country of origin. Um, so, so yeah. Um, in terms of the IAEA, again, the, you've got very prescribed um, tools that they can use on very prescribed locations. And so that's what um, the IAEA is doing to make sure that, again, it can make a, a reasonable argument that nuclear material in any given country is actually under safeguards. Um, and when they are not, right, the IAEA writes that report and it's reported to the United Nations. And then subsequently, um, you have other actions taken, usually in the Security Council. Yeah, we all remember, for instance, the movie Lord of the Wars, where Nicolas mm -hmm. Cage is converting the combat helicopter to rescue helicopter just by uh, magic of a paperwork. So, so therefore, yeah. this is quite important that, as you said, language of or accuracy. So of we had the same, expression. yeah. So we just we just went through it with INF, right? So you know, it, it didn't really, it didn't take much to 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 you know bootstrap different systems right into being an INF system. Um, so, which 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 could also speak to the 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 point that that treaty maybe was naturally no longer fit for purpose. Um, so, yeah, let's speak a bit uh, in more details about two treaties that we mentioned already. The first one is uh, New Start, and mm -hmm. that was Russia that withdrew from the agreement, and then the United States follow. And the second one is Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, also known as the INF Treaty. Can we name the implications of these two acts on the global arms control? Yeah, so for, for New START, um, thankfully, I think up to this point, our best estimates are that all countries are still abiding by the caps that have been set out inside of that regime, regardless of the treaty collapse. Of course, whether that follows into the future or not is an open question because outside of a treaty regime, there is no reason necessarily to follow a particular ceiling. Um, I think one of the drivers of that ceiling is primarily the program of record. So the fact that you have you know, countries that have already made this commitment, they've created the program of record around that commitment, and so you're not going to change it. Um, there also could just be that it could be enough. The challenge for nonproliferation across the globe is that both 
Moscow and Washington are under pressure every single time that they go to the NPT review conference, which is the nonproliferation regime's big conference that they held this year. And they need to convince all the signatories to the nonproliferation treaty that they are actually abiding by their Article 6 commitments to work towards disarmament. That's a much more difficult argument to make in the absence of the New START agreement. Because effectively what New START was doing was it followed on various other strategic arms reduction agreements that brought down the number of nuclear weapons across the globe pretty significantly. Uh, and so the expectation was that actually potentially that number was going to get lower in the next round of negotiations that were slated for, um, you know, slated to come into force after 2026. Um, so that's probably what I would say about, about New START. Um, in terms of INF, right, the INF kind of falling apart starts in the early 2010s when the Russians deploy an INF system. And then eventually the United States found the Russians were non-compliant and the Russians made no movement to come back, back into compliance. And ultimately the Trump administration left the agreement. Um, that arguably has had a little bit more of an effect on um, right global, the different types of qualitative capabilities that you're deploying because now both sides effectively have intermediate range nuclear forces. Um, so there you actually do have a shift uh, um, based on the collapse of that arrangement. Um, you know, I think the the kind of the academic hot take on that one is that for Russia in particular, that agreement no longer made any sort of strategic sense because on their part, right, they had European countries to worry about. And from the United States part, they weren't really worried about Canada and Mexico. Um, and so it was an asymmetrical, um, it was an asymmetrical uh, treaty from their perspective. Now, one of the interesting things that's maybe an unintended consequence of INF falling apart is that now the Americans have a little bit more freedom of action in East Asia than they might have had otherwise. Um, as you know, one considers forward deployment of nuclear capabilities in places like South Korea um, or what have you. Um, and so one of the funny things about INF was that it was actually limiting American freedom of action in East Asia. Um, and there were some conversations and arguments about that um, in the US context, uh, but now the INF treaty has gone away, right? There's no limit there. Um, and indeed, that might be one of the things that's on the table for any future arrangement between Moscow, Beijing, and DC moving forward. And what's about the arms control and the connection to the arms race? Do you think that now new arms race has started as there is no specific agreement mm -hmm. maybe maybe those big powers or middle powers they might feel some sort of freedom oh the big ones are not following the suit so let's do something yeah. and also let's benefit from this situation yeah that's that's the fear i mean i think that the the major the major country that's driving proliferation of nuclear capability across the globe currently is china so you've got quantitative increases. And obviously there's disagreements about what those ultimate numbers are going to be. Uh, but let's say for the sake of the argument, the US DOD is right and that it's a thousand, you know, a thousand nuclear weapons by 2030. So you've got a significant increase of quantitative capability in China, and then you've got qualitative broadening, right? So you've got the proliferation of a submarine capability and the ICBM silos that right, colleagues like Matt Corda and Decker Ephelith have gone and found um, in the open source. Um, and so um you've got that change now in the united states you've got a constituency in congress that says well the united states needs to have the number of nuclear weapons that matches the russians plus the chinese together right in my view that's not the right way to think about that problem the right way to think about the problem is how you offset the capabilities that your two adversaries are deploying and that could mean quantitative increases and in qualitative broadening at the margins so in the United States, right, we have Slick MN, the submarine launched cruise missile, um, this nuclear tip that's being developed, and that's part of that broadening. Um, but hopefully, right, for those of us that want to try to drive nuclear risk down, it doesn't involve too much quantitative increase. Um, and at the same time, of course, the issue is that you've got something of a contagion, right? So, right, China's capabilities is eventually going to impact India's capabilities, which is going to impact Pakistan's capabilities. And obviously, both of those impact to some degree Iran's seeking of a weapon. And of course, then you worry about proliferation risk down, right? Because if Iran gets a weapon, then the Saudi Arabians got a weapon, etc. Um, and so you have that flowing down. And so I think one of the things that in the nuclear arena, we've managed to avoid thus far is a major arms race of the type that we saw during the early days of the Cold War, 
Um, but whether that holds into the future, I'm not sure. Um, I will say that in non-nuclear technology domains, we have had an arms race and we are in an arms race. Um, some of that's driven by the need to replace conventional capability that's being used in Ukraine uh, by both sides, right, of that, of that conflict. Um, and then also, um, you know, worries about things like artificial intelligence technologies. So, both, you know, both, well, all of China, Russia, and the United States are plowing money into AI because they worry that there's going to be some sort of uh, significant impact of that capability. Whether it will or not, I think is a little bit of an open question, uh, but we're already in something of an AI arms race. Definitely. And it's also, there is a joke uh, when you speak about how many nuclear weapons a particular state has. And, mm -hmm. and, and one professor asked, like, so how many times can you destroy the world? Yeah. So because once at, at least eight, <laughs> at least because, eight, give or take. Yeah. Because, because in my logic, when you have, let's say, 2000 nuclear weapons, and if you use five, let's say, in the global in the global spectrum, that's already the world is 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 gone. So that's uh, of course we have like well, it depends, small, depends what type of what which yeah. which warhead, right? So, yeah, it, it, it can yeah. be a very small one, of course. But I'm I'm speaking about those big ones that are they are promoting on those propaganda videos that we have the biggest or the strongest yeah, nuclear yeah, yeah. weapon. Yeah, yeah, heavy. And we have we have eight hundred or one thousand of them in the storage, you know. But when something is happening. Usually they 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 don't use that weapon, so that that also kind of deterrence that we 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 speak about the, the numbers. Well, that's a really so that's a really important point, right? So ultimately, these capabilities are not they're they're the singular military technology that's designed not to be used. Um, so it's the the idea is by having the appropriate qualitative right distribution and quantitative numbers such that you're able to deter your adversary via right the punishment mechanism right so you're trying to make sure that your adversary um you know doesn't take the action that they otherwise would for fear of punishment and that's what nuclear weapons are designed for and so you know we've got all of these quotes from former secretaries of defense that say right like hey look you know these are these are weapons that are you know designed not to be used Andrew, is it still correct to say uh, or state that the only country that used nuclear weapons was the United States? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, one of the things that the crisis in Ukraine is demonstrating is that nuclear coercion occurs in a variety of different ways beyond just use. So, for example, the use of locations like Zaporizhia or more recently, right, conversations about the, the targeting or, or leveraging of the Kursk nuclear power plant. Um, you know, you see sort of um, the IAEA in particular getting very worried about both. Um, so effectively, nuclear threats take a variety of forms. But yes, right, the idea is that we never have another situation like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, particularly given the civilian, you know, the civilian consequences. Um, yeah, for sure. I think it's also important to, to mention that when someone is speaking about enriched uranium weapons, that's not nuclear weapons. Yeah, so spent uranium shells are generally not considered to be nuclear weapons use. Although, I mean, ultimately, there's no such. It's all on a continuum, right? Like, ultimately, we're we're political scientists here, right? We live in the gray. It's not black or white. Um, so, you know, similarly, you know, the, the we like we worry about radiological weapons, so weapons that have radiological effects. Generally, we'll consider them separate from nuclear capabilities when we're thinking about risks, etc. Um, so, so yeah, it just kind of depends on where you want to kind of draw the line. Uh, but you know, the, the way that most of us think about nuclear weapons, it's, you know, very significant blast effects, very significant radiation effects. Um, you know, the, some of the other com the capabilities got a little bit more complicated. So for example, um, you can detonate a nuclear weapon at altitude and get EMP effects that will impact, right. The ability for, you know, electricity grids to work or your computer to work, right? Um, E1 and E3 waves. Um, so, um, so yeah, at some point, right, some specificity does matter. Um, but, you know, insofar as there's a norm or a taboo on the use of nuclear capabilities, generally speaking, the uranium shells don't fall inside that category. Um, right. Let's go through more arms control and geopolitics, and let's uh, examine some stances or some approaches of states towards arms control. And let's start with uh, our favorite one, and it's China. So how is mm -hmm. China's approach to arms control? Are there any initiatives from their side, uh, from, from China? 
And and how is uh, China accepted in the global arms control sort of regime, as you say? Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned, um, they refused to attend an arms control negotiation involving Beijing, Moscow, and Washington under the Trump administration. Um, as far as I'm aware, right, that position hasn't shifted. They don't really want to engage on nuclear arms control. Uh, but at the same time, they do engage on all sorts of other types of technology governance regimes. So, for example, they were in Bletchley Park for the AI Safety Summit that the United Kingdom hosted. Um, and that was, you know, a big deal. And the Chinese have their own perspectives on what they want a regulatory regime to look like for AI technologies and AI safety. Um, there's also a number of track two dialogues that are, you know, taking place between the Chinese and the Americans. And that may or may not eventually lead to some sort of formal negotiations on, on nuclear issues from the Chinese perspective, which, you know, arguably is quite reasonable. They've got significantly smaller numbers of warheads in the United States. So their position is, well, what are we going to negotiate over? <laughs> right. Um, on the other side of it, I think there is an argument that, that Americans, amongst others, make, which is that China is going through the most rapid expansion of qualitative capability and quantitative increase that we've ever seen in the world. And so if you if your primary worry about nuclear weapons is not their use in war, but actually some of the inadvertent uses of capabilities in terms of accidents or uh, what have you, you're really worried about those those that proliferation time horizon because you're really worried that things might go wrong. And so I think that's something that, you know, certainly the United States has a history of actually sharing various ways to handle nuclear material in a weaponized context to try to drive down that risk. So, for example, in the 1990s, and Scott Sagan's got some very good work on this, um, there was a lot of Americans sent to Pakistan to actually help them do to do basically providing technical assistance to try to make their nuclear capability as safe as as, as humanly possible. Uh, so, you know, I think that there's you know potential space for that too. But but yeah, there's not much of an appetite um, on the, on the Chinese side to engage in formal arms control reduction or limitation type arrangements. Just a follow up question. Are there any consultations between Russia and China about this topic, or it's not on the table? Well, I mean, sitting here in Berkeley, that's very unclear. Um, I mean, ultimately, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of conversations taking place between China and Russia on all things military. And so I would be shocked that nuclear never came up. Now, you know, it's it is the case that when countries sometimes table right certain conversations, they're shut down immediately and said, you know, absolutely not. So, for example, right in NATO, Anytime the conversation moves nuclear, the French leave the room um, because they're not a part of um, the the nuclear deterrent that's a part of NATO. Um, they do it by themselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I wonder, I can't imagine that the Chinese would be terribly willing to think about their nuclear capabilities in concert with the Russians. I mean, one of the things that people need to bear in mind about China and Russia is that they actually do have a pretty significant history of going to war with one another. Um, indeed, they went to war with one another more recently than most countries. Uh, um, to some extent, right, the enemy of my enemy is my friend type arrangement. And certainly the Chinese have given the Russians an option to exit the sanctions regime regime um, in the context of Ukraine. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I, I, I would be surprised, but I, I mean, there's no way to know one way or the other. Right. The next round, India and Pakistan. Yeah, they talk to each other. I mean, so so there, right, you're really worried about some of those accidents. Um, and, you know, recent history suggests that those accidents are actually something to be worried about. Um, so like I mentioned, they do have various agreements that are, um, you know, focused on trying to drive down nuclear risk. Um, there are no, as far as I'm aware, there's no appetite to kind of revisit those arrangements and build on them, per se. Um I, whether that changes or not, we'll, we'll see. Um, but um, but yeah, Iran and Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not talking. <laughs> They're not talking. They're but, not talking. Uh, but, and, but but Iran also yeah. But Iran, Iran also would argue that they have nothing to negotiate over because they don't have a nuclear capability. So you know the reason. I think there are a couple of recent reports um, that you know in in the in the media that uh, Iran were exceedingly close to a weapon. I think one of the things you know 
the audience should bear in mind is that generally speaking, if you're a country that's proliferating a nuclear capability, you're not going to tell anybody when you've just got one. You're going to tell people when you've got some. Now, what that some number is, you know, you're not sure. Um, but um, but yeah, no, they're not. They're not talking. And and in terms of Israel, is Israel part of any international agreement in terms of arms control? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. No. I mean, again, technology governance writ large, like absolutely, right? They take part in various different UN conversations. Um, indeed, they'll, I think, have some interesting things to say about lethal autonomous weapons and also about missile defense systems, uh, given recent history. Um, but, you know, the appetite to engage on nuclear issues is next to zero. Yeah. Federation of American Scientists and the Stockholm Institute of Peace Research. There we go. Uh, sorry, International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. So CIPRI and FAST, both of them have estimates for yes. all countries on an annual basis, right? Hans Christensen and Matt Korda do a really nice job of keeping those updated. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's effectively, right, in the in the scholarly community, that's our best guess. And, and ultimately, again, no countries are really disclosing, with the exception of Russia and the United States under their new start obligations, no countries are actually reporting. So it's all a guess, really. Right. And uh, the last round uh, is United Kingdom and France. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, I think that there, there may be a mechanism to create some sort of new minilateral arrangement that involves... So, so basically, Russia's position has been that it needs to think about Britain, France, and the United States together. Okay. I'm, I, I mean, again, speaking as, as an academic in the space... Probably the Americans and the Brits can figure out a joint position. The French, right, tend to want to think about their nuclear deterrent as belonging solely to them and only in their context, and so don't really engage in these conversations. Um, that said, right, all three were to, as the as the P3 work together inside of the MPT context to present the perspective of right that that subs that subset of nuclear weapon states. Um, so we'll see. Um, we'll see, uh, particularly if it's going to be engaging with Beijing and Moscow together. So I, I don't think that a five party arrangement on driving nuclear risk down is outside of, you know, the, 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 off the cards. Indeed, the P5 arrangement actually arguably is, is the one that's most likely to go somewhere. Um, yeah. Right. I skipped North Korea because I think the answer is clear over there. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Unfortunately, the, the country remains close to in, in for, for these questions, at least. But I want yeah. to ask you, Andrew, is there any country aspiring to get a nuclear weapon? And I'm not speaking about Iran, but I'm speaking mm -hmm. about some new countries like we have never heard before. But maybe there are some indications that your research might observe that the country is trying to get at least some sort of nuclear weapon. Yeah, so you know, there's, it's a big question. I got multiple colleagues, right? Matt Furman, uh, Rachel Whitlark, among the uh, Rupal Meta, um, who all tried to measure what we call nuclear latency. Um, so basically, how close you can you are to actually getting a nuclear weapon. Um, and there are various countries that fall right inside of that very high amount of latency that you know could very quickly probably spin up a weapon um so as i mentioned in in the context of the iranians potential to proliferate saudi arabia is in this conversation uh by virtue of their fairly advanced nuclear energy capabilities south korea japan and germany are also a part of this story um in terms of countries that are um you know looking at nuclear technology for military purposes Right, things like the AUKUS agreement that involve the Australians, right? That's another country as well inside of that context. So for them, right, it's for naval propulsion. Um, but but yeah, those are the those are the ones that I think are, are kind of top of mind. And one of the things that the United States has tried to do by virtue of its extended deterrence relationship with Japan and South Korea is try to arrest their drive to actually engage in nuclear proliferation. Um, so recently, um, the United States and the South Koreans signed the Washington Declaration, which actually involved a step increase in the amount of nuclear sharing. And so the South Koreans have actually created their own version of STRATCOM to engage on nuclear issues with the US. And the US's position is that it would like, it would prefer all else equal for the South Koreans not to create their own deterrent. Um, and that they ought to rely on the United States. Um, so, so those are the countries that are kind of in the um, in in that conversation.
Absolutely. And I think it's also worth of mentioning that if someone is researching this question, it's always good to have a look who is uh, able to construct a nuclear power plant. Because yep, that, right. that, that research is always connected with the military in some way. I'm not saying yeah. that this is the main criterion, but uh, from my research, what I research, whatever we have, it's sort of institute of something, nuclear research is always connected to military purposes because that's the way how to get the weapon and the technology. Because one thing is yeah. to have a nuclear weapon from the Soviet times, and the second thing is to have a modern nuclear weapon. And that's, uh, that's also the story to mention, because we know that in the past, when the Soviet Union had all those nuclear weapons, some countries tried to get it. Um, basically, the IAEA looks over all of those civilian applications and tries to stop the divergence of material, right, into... I mean, the, the challenge is that... So when you're enriching uranium, right, it's... Um, it's it's a it's, it's a geometric curve, right? This in the opposite direction. So the amount of work that it takes to enrich at low levels is higher than the amount of energy that you need to enrich at the higher levels. And so you have this curve, right? That looks something like this. Um, and so um, if you, you can get to let's say you know twenty percent, which might be useful for a nuclear fuel cycle, the amount of the work that it takes you to get from zero to twenty is the same amount of work, or, or potentially more work than it takes to get from twenty to. 80, uh, so highly enriched uranium. Um, and so it's the IAEA, IAEA has a big challenge. And back in the 90s, right, there was a whole bunch of work to secure the Soviet nuclear assets and make sure that none of them fell into the wrong hands. Um, so Tom Clancy, right, made a career about writing about them as novels. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to try to make sure that loose nukes weren't a problem um, and that we didn't have that nuclear security risk. Yeah, and also the second layer would be the sort of unstable regimes, as we see, yeah. for instance, in Pakistan, uh, where we had like yeah, coup or, or, or some sort of demonstration. And then you're not 100% sure who is in control of nuclear weapons, like, yeah. who, like with which general and, and who has a button, as we say, or or the sealed That's case right. that, that following. The last section, Andrew, for us uh, to discuss today is to find some new ideas. So the first question would be, what sort of gaps can you see in the current international arms control framework based on your research? And maybe you can mention a few ideas that you think might be important to implement for the future, because we see that AI technology and everything is developing. And sometimes people asking, who is in control of AI? Can AI launch a nuclear weapon? And, and, and questions like that. And these questions are new questions. Though those questions that we didn't have 15 or 20 or 30 years ago. So how do you see this problematic? Yeah, so on the last point, right? Like the, the Russians did have the perimeter system, right? So arguably they had something of a dead hand, which is something we talk about in the context of AI NC3. Uh, today, I think that, I think that really, you know, my take here is that we we say that arm. So there's a various there's a whole bunch of scholarly articles talking about the end of arms control, um, and you know, fundamentally, I disagree. Right? I think it's potentially the end of the bilateral formal arrangements inside of treaties that we got used to, at least for a period of time. But there's a whole bunch of technology governance work to be done regardless, um, and that. You know, ultimately, in some in some cases, you know, creating arrangements that don't necessarily have the strongest verification regimes is actually fine, right? You can rely on things like national technical means in order to try to verify. Uh, but sometimes the talking is the best that you're going to be able to get. And so you should try to engage. Um, and so, you know, those are the types of things that, um, that certainly, you know, I, I, I've been calling for. And it comes from working at track twos to track 1.5s to get yourself those track ones on the back end. And so um, that's kind of how, how I think about that issue. Um, in terms of the broader set of new technologies, the very first place that these conversations live when they kind of rise is, is the uh, conven the convention on certain conventional weapons, uh, which is a really bizarre name for a, for, for a convention in the UN. Um, so that's actually where things like lethal autonomous weapons fall. Um, and so the CCW is ultimately where they start, and then it becomes a question of how you kind of deal with it. So for example, with AI military integration, that conversation is taking place in re-aim, right? Which is being led by the South Koreans now. It was led by the Netherlands before. Um, and so 
you know, again, a lot of this stuff is about thinking about principles and norms and codes of conduct, right, etc. Um, and you're trying to start to build some sort of regime around them. Uh, um, so I think that's where that's where most of the work is. Are there any incentives that the global community can offer to countries and say, look, we know that you can get a nuclear weapon or you have nuclear nuclear weapons, but uh, here are some incentives. And if you follow them, my, maybe you can forget about it and, and focus on something else. Oh, absolutely. So the nuclear regime, in my view, is built on carrots and sticks. So the carrot, the carrot right, of the non-proliferation regime is you will have access to nuclear technology for power for medicine right etc um so that's that's the carrot right the stick is if you do not abide by the agreement you're going to get sanctioned right um you're going to be pulled up in front of the un security council etc and so um those carrots and sticks have always been uh what bolstered that particular regime so even if you have a sort of digital governance how can you secure the nuclear weapons as a one country should there be a multilateral initiative to secure those weapons and sort of and sort of transparent reports uh, about how secure are the nuclear weapons in particular country? Because this is a big concern, I think. And also with those unstable regimes, a, a person can change, a prime minister can change, and someone might use this opportunity to get some malware or some cyber attack on those facilities. So how do we know that in all those countries that have nuclear weapons, the people are serious about those defense measurement? I mean, ultimately, you rely, you're you relying on it being, their, it being in their interest to harden against that type of attack. So, you know, all nuclear weapons, regardless of who has them, um, has to address the always never dilemma. So you always want to have your nuclear weapons available to you. And when you choose to use them, you always want them to work. You never want them to go off and be used when you don't want them to work. And so all countries need to solve that always never dilemma. And there's any number of things that you do to try to drive down that risk. So for example, um, with regards to cyber risk, you don't have right the internet inside of nuclear systems, right? You want to... You don't want you want to separate your IT technology from your OT technology. Um, you know you want to look at your supply chain risks all the way down, right? Because obviously technologies are agglomerations of you know other bits, right? Other parts, um, and so you do that cyber risk profile all the way down your supply chain. Um, and so it's in all countries' interest to kind of do do that. Um, ultimately, right? Like we don't have inspectors from the US. We don't have inspectors from NGOs walking into military nuclear facilities in countries like Pakistan, for example. Um, right? Like I said before, there's various different types of technical assistance that you try to do to drive down the risk of nuclear accidents and what have you. But ultimately, it's each country's sovereign responsibility to kind of deal with, you know, if they've chosen to proliferate nuclear weapons, they need to figure out how to make it safe. Uh, yeah, they're they're the, there are various things that countries have done in the past. So, for example, if you're worried about the um, the military regime using weapons outside of right the civilian government saying, yes, go for it, you might want to demate your nuclear warheads from the delivery platform, right? So that's been discussed in various different contexts. And so, yeah, you want to try to drive down that risk. Um so, but yeah, of course, like all of the scenarios that we go, you know, we do in our war games and stuff, right? Kind of drive, you know, pull on that risk and think about all the things that could potentially go wrong. Um, Eric Schlosser's book is really good for that, by the way, if you, want to, if you don't want to sleep at night. So, yeah. Great. I can, I can include this in the YouTube description. Uh, yeah. Logically, Andrew, when we spoke about uh, arms control, we mostly spoke about nuclear weapons. Are there any other weapons or emerging weapons, uh, for instance, for the next 10 years or 20 years, that you think that we should also focus closely with arms control on them? Oh, on those, I'm going to be terribly self-serving. Yeah, so I'll give you two. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think I think any sort of weapon that can be used in the, in the space domain is something that we worry about a lot. Obviously, right, the Russian proliferation of a capability that would be an in-orbit nuclear-tipped anti-satellite capability um, is something that we worry a lot about and leading people to revisit the Outer Space Treaty um, and what have you. And so, you know, corbital systems, even direct ascent um, anti-satellite capabilities, 
Um, I think that's a, that'll, that'll be a place where where we look pretty closely. Um, and then the various different combinations of AI technologies and military assets um, as well. So, you know, we already have, I think, CIPRI numbers put it as something like 80 deployed autonomous weapons that are we already have right out there in the world. Um, primarily, those are missile defense uh, capabilities. Uh, but that'll also be a place where, you know, people are spending a lot of time. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in the AI X nuclear conversation. Um, because I mean, AI capabilities have been used for things like early warning for like five decades. Uh, but you're not going to see an AI dead hand system um, anytime soon. I wouldn't have thought. Um, but primarily because it's in danger of leading to an accident, right? Not not because it wouldn't help you with deterrence overall, but because you worry about the system, right? Failing that always never problem that we talked about earlier. Um, so th those are the two places that I would probably look first. There are conversations about how to think about control of hypersonic weapon systems. Uh, so, you know, that's, a you know, arguably that's already dealt with a little bit by the missile re regimes that we have, but that'll probably be in the conversation if, Moscow and Washington never, never sit down again. Um, and then in, uh, and the other piece of that will obviously be the non-strategic nuclear weapons too. So The last question for today's inter interview, Andrew. And I want to use the fact that you are founder of the Berkeley Risk and Security Lab, which uh, produce, uh, which produces uh, good, good articles and, and, and good publications. What would be the areas of research or areas for research in this area of arms control or global arms control for the for the future students maybe research uh, or junior researchers and something you might recommend as uh, areas that require more attention and uh, they might be potential good areas for research yeah so my pitch is let's focus on technology governance not arms control um and you know any number of the technologies that we've talked about today are fair game um, you know, obviously my lab's really focused on the emerging technology tech set. Um, so right, artificial intelligence, cyber capabilities, um, quantum sensing capabilities, which may be more interesting than quantum computing capabilities. Um, so, you know, I think there's any number of things, but also not to, you know, not to lose sight of the, you know, there, there can be a tendency to get very wrapped up in the emerging tech issue. Um, but there's a lot of very basic military technology problems that also need to be addressed. So, for example, the defense industrial base, how to build it, how to sustain it, what it needs to look like moving forward. Um, you know, those are a bunch of questions that aren't getting asked and answered um, and, you know, arguably actually have a more significant impact on conflict. Um, so I would probably point people there as well. Um, so, you know, do do some of the sexy stuff, but also worry about some of the fundamentals. Absolutely. Andrew, many thanks for your contribution to the channel, for your insightful thoughts about this topic. As I said at, at, in the beginning, I think uh, because we have the war in Ukraine and Israel-Iran tensions, this topic is slightly in the background, but I think it needs more attention because as big powers or superpowers are ignoring the treaties or they are withdrawing from the treaties, they are completely abandoning them, now we have a sort of period of uncertainty, like uh, we don't know yeah, what's going to happen, like are they going to sign a new agreement or not? Are we going to regulate those nuclear weapons or not? Maybe they will spread uh, the nu nuclear, nuclear weapons to other countries, which is also a possibility as the world is dividing at the moment and people are speaking about more multipolarity, people are speaking about the fight between the Western values and Eastern values. So there are many geopolitical and political thoughts to consider when we speak about arms control. So again, Andrew, many thanks for being on Thinker. Perfect. Thanks, Martin.